Alors, euh, cette session porte sur euh, les regards croisés régionaux et on va parler d'exemples de, de mobilité pour les étudiants, les professeurs et coopération internationale. Ladies and gentlemen, s'il vous plaît. S'il vous plaît. Please. Bon, d'accord. Alors, il n'est euh, pas 11 heures, il est 11 heures euh, et 10. Donc, euh, nous allons absolument devoir terminer euh, à 11 heures 35. And uh, again, I will be merciless. <laughs> so, if you have a point to make, make it quickly. Or, or else I will cut you off. Sorry about that, but uh, that's the role they gave me. Alors, chaque intervenant euh, va parler de son, de son projet. Et euh, on est 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Alors, euh, chacun a 5 minutes. 5 minutes. 5 minutes. More or less. But I will cut you off. Alors, premier intervenant. Dr. Balthazar Ndivuguruzwa, recteur de l'Université catholique de Cap Gaï au Rwanda. Merci beaucoup. Je m'appelle Balthazar, je suis recteur de l'Université catholique, de l'Institut catholique du roi de Cap Gaï au Rwanda. Euh, je vous remercie pour l'invitation et je voudrais d'abord m'excuser. Euh, J'ai reçu l'invitation hier euh, vers 16h. La personne qui était prévue n'est pas arrivée. Et puis je suis tout nouveau comme recteur. Je n'ai pas encore euh, <rire> célébré un anniversaire. Voilà, j'ai essayé de glaner quelques idées et que je voudrais vous proposer. La mobilité des étudiants, des professeurs, c'est un de nos souhaits, de nos souhaits les plus ardents, que nous espérons voir se réaliser effectivement et au sein de notre fédération. Si cela se réalisait, effectivement, notre fédération aura été vraiment catholique. Je voudrais parler du point de vue à partir du point de vue de notre université et peut-être aussi de plusieurs universités en Afrique. Un des défis majeurs de nos universités est celui de la pauvreté. Pauvreté en termes d'effectifs et de qualification du personnel académique. En ce qui concerne la mobilité des professeurs, chez nous, pour parier ce problème, des universités se partagent quelques professeurs avec soit un statut de visiteur, professeur visiteur, soit avec un statut de professeur permanent. Mais il y a aussi un problème aussi qui survient, c'est qu'en Afrique, et principalement dans notre pays, le Rwanda, et ces professeurs sont visiteurs et permanents dans plusieurs institutions, dans plusieurs endroits. Et souvent, le rendement laisse à désirer car ils n'ont pas le temps, assez de temps pour préparer leurs leur cours, ils n'ont pas le temps pour accompagner les étudiants. Et souvent, la relation qui nous unit avec ces professeurs, c'est souvent la relation d'argent, de, de salaire. 
Nous recourons aussi aux professeurs des pays voisins. Dans notre université, nous recourons principalement aux professeurs venant du Kenya et de l'Ouganda. Et cela entraîne un coût très, très élevé pour payer leurs prestations. Et, et nos budgets sont souvent vacillants par rapport à cela. Au niveau de notre région, surtout de la région en Afrique de l'Est, nous avons une association des universités d'Afrique de l'Est, Inter-University Council of East Africa, qui a commencé à initier le programme de la mobilité des professeurs. Mais on se rend compte qu'à la fin, on devient comme le serpent qui se mord la queue. Euh, on, on voudrait en avoir, mais on n'en a pas, parce que justement l'effectif, le, le nombre ne suffit pas. Et on se retrouve toujours au problème de, de, des finances. Et chez nous, le problème de mobilité des professeurs est lié au problème de nos finances. Nous, nous avons un problème de, de former nos, notre personnel académique euh, au niveau du doctorat. Cela, ça, cela coûte cher. Et puis alors, euh, les salaires sont, sont maigres. Nous ne recevons aucun subside de la part de l'État. Aucune autre source de revenus excepté les frais payés par, par les étudiants. À propos de la mobilité des, des étudiants, euh, dans notre université, nous avons initié en 2012 un partenariat interuniversitaire avec une école de commerce de Lyon. Et nous avons accueilli ces étudiants qui sont venus pour un, un semestre mais le programme n'a pas continué. Et dans l'article du partenariat, de l'accord, il est expulé. L'ISECA pourra renforcer ses capacités en se dotant d'enseignants permanents qualifiés formés par cette école de commerce de Lyon. Et les étudiants de cette école, une minute, pourront découvrir la réalité des problématiques du développement d'un pays d'Afrique subsaharienne et d'un enseignement en milieu multiculturel. C'était vraiment au début un accord gagnant-gagnant. Ce que je voudrais dire à la fin, à la conclusion, c'est peut-être une exhortation que je tire de la lettre de Saint-Pierre. La parole de Dieu nous dit « Ce que chacun de nous a reçu, chacun de vous a reçu comme don de la grâce » Mettez-le au service des autres comme de bons gérants de la grâce de Dieu sous toutes ses formes. Toutes ces formes de la grâce de Dieu peuvent se décliner en termes de temps, d'expérience, de compétences, d'expertise, de nos richesses culturelles, de nos richesses matérielles et de, de moyens financiers. Alors j'ai un rêve, j'ai un rêve, je voudrais terminer par un rêve. I have a dream. Nous sommes en train de célébrer le 50e anniversaire de, de, du discours de Martin Luther King. I have a dream. Alors, ce rêve, c'est de voir dans nos aéroports un contingent de professeurs qui ont un badge ou un t-shirt ou un, un petit drapeau inscrit « Association des professeurs sans vacances » ou association des professeurs sans frontières. Un autre rêve que j'ai, et le dernier, c'est de voir un cortège des géants qui portent sur les épaules des nains. Qui est géant, qui est nain Peut-être tout être humain est quelque part à la fois géant et nain. Ce que je voudrais dire, c'est que nous avons besoin de nous épauler, de nous porter les uns les autres, et nous avons besoin d'être portés aussi par les autres. Merci. Alors, uh, next speaker, uh, professeur Wojtek Zizak, recteur de l'Université pontificale de Jean-Paul II et vice-président de la FUC. Oh, merci beaucoup. 
my name is Wojciech Zyzak. I represent the Pontifical University John Paul II in Krakow in Poland. And uh, the first question with, when we uh, discuss the problem of mobility for students and professors is, I think, this is the problem of money. Who will pay for this mobility? And we are in Europe, in, in the European Union, uh, really very, very happy because we have this uh, Erasmus now, Erasmus Plus project. Here in Dublin, in, there's a beautiful garden, St. Stephen's Green, and in this garden now is a very interesting exposition dedicated to 30 years of this project Erasmus Plus. And uh, in this uh, exposition we can see the, the photos of young couples with children, couples that uh, met during this uh, experience of Erasmus. And so we see this is not only a scientific project, but also a very important personal experience. And I think very important for Europe to overcome divisions, to work together, to reconcile different points of view, to, to learn uh, cooperation. This is very important for us to study or teach in an, another country, to build an open European Union, especially in these hard times in, in the face of nationalism also in Europe. Uh, it's clear that studying abroad improves employment prospects uh, because it's not only uh, the possibility to study, it's also the possibility to take part in uh, internships abroad. Uh, and uh, I represent a small institution. We have only 3,000 students. Um, but we are really very happy because every year uh, almost 100 students go abroad and, and come to us. Um, this is one side of, uh, of this problem. On the other hand, uh, I have to mention that we send always the best students, the students that uh, speak foreign languages, that are very talented. And this is the experience of uh, uh, less rich countries in Europe that we send the students abroad to richer countries and they very often don't want to come back. So this is this uh, mobility is uh, on one hand on the one hand opportunity for the people but on the other hand is also a little bit problematic for the countries that are not so rich because it becomes sometimes uh, another type of uh, brain drain. Uh, I think about 100,000 young people from Poland that are now in Ireland and in the same time we have more than a million people from the Ukraine uh, looking for better life. So this is also an aspect of, of uh, mobility. And uh, in the European context, uh, I'd like to mm, underline another thing uh, that seems to be typically European problem, but it's not. Uh, I th it means uh, I mean the uh, the migrants problem. One minute, yes. 
and uh, we have this pro project uh, here in IFQ. Uh, it means uh, refugee lab, and uh, we signed last year in Rome another an agreement, uh, uh, refugee and uh, migrants migrant education network. And I think it's, uh, it's very important. It's also a part of, of this program of migration. Uh, my time is done. Thank you. Next speaker, Monsignor Leslie Morris, President Xavier Board of Higher Education, India. Uh, India is um, a subcontinent with a federal structure, 22 official languages, 1,600 plus languages. But lucky for the uh, colonial rule, most of the higher education is in English, which makes it possible for mobility of students as well as professors. Uh, India, for more than 60 years, has the government a project called Indo-Cultural Relations Exchange Program. About 3,000 students are selected by the government of India from across the globe who apply and who qualify, who study for three years or five years in India, which itself is a big thing. Uh, in a university where I was teaching, we had students from 32 countries studying with us, a uh, graduate or a postgraduate program. Besides, a number of our colleges have MOUs with some of the universities in the United States, in Europe, where students come for a semester or for a year and study what is being taught in our colleges or universities, and the credits are exchanged and they, are, they get their degrees and their parent universities. Uh, compared to the cost which is involved, the cost which is involved in India for studies is very, very minimal, especially for those who come from Europe and US. The cost for studies is very minimal, except probably the travel cost. But what they get back is something very, very enriching. Most of the students who come there come with a different view of India and go back enriched with the rich culture, the rich uh, uh, the diverse, the diversity that is there in India, and a different picture of India altogether, how uh, unity is possible in spite of diversity of languages and cultures and religions. Uh, regarding the mobility of the professors, uh, we have, as it has been already said, uh, the cost is the main concern. We do organize, whenever there is a conference or something like that, as some professors visiting, a couple of colleges join together and we try to use their services for maybe guest lectures, but lect uh, professors coming to teach a full semester or a year is something which is expensive, it's not possible. We are sometimes exploring the possibility of you know, online Skype teaching where we can have an interaction. Uh, other than that, uh, the government is quite open for students and Indian students going abroad is really a sizable one. Most of the Australian universities, the Middle East universities, the European universities, the US universities come to market their courses in India because the number of students who go is quite a big number. Uh, some of them cannot afford it, but bank loans are available, which they repay later. But that way, the mobility is possible. And I feel that this type of mobility for students is really very good because it being, brings greater solidarity, which IFCO has been speaking about. And I think in IFCO there has to be probably rethinking about solidarity. Uh, I pose this question to the whole assembly because we speak of solidarity, I think when we speak of solidarity, the IFCO has to probably take a, a concrete decision how that solidarity can be concretized in exchange programs, probably exchanging of professors, exchanging of teachers, maybe adapting some of the colleges or universities for specific projects, which I'm sure will bring about greater solidarity and something make IFCO really effective. Thank you. Next presenter, Dr. Francisco Gomez Ortiz, Rector of the Catholic University. No, yes, no. 
Yes, Catholic yes, University. yes. Catholic University of Colombia and Regional Vice President of Oducal. Well, I will try to, because I have a presentation, but since we have only five minutes, I will try to present it uh, very quickly. Um, I would like to thank the few for, the few for this in, uh, invitation and for giving. Microphone. Okay. Um, I would like to thank the EFCO for this invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share with all this space. <coughs> I want to begin with my initial thoughts on the topic that is being addressed by this panel, to then convey certain trends in revealed by a recent study on internationalization in Latin America, which provides a context to discuss the mechanisms that we currently have for integration and for other initiatives that we may explore. Since the end of the Second World War, the world has moved towards converging on the idea that there are universal values and interests that needed to be promoted. The promotion of human rights, the importance of global cooperation, the need to advance towards sustainable development and the value of education as an engine for progress and social changes are just some of these common interests that have driven our collective actions. Throughout the years, these interests have combined and consolidated in certain cases with the idea that we are living in the era of globalization, which has enabled us to interact, communicate, and transport better and faster. But these wonderful changes are facing processes that in a certain way may be contradictory to the spirit of globalization. We are dealing with a perception that this is skeptic about migratory dynamics from south to north or about benefits derived from free trade between nations. This creates a need to think and act under different paradigms that fit these new realities in several scenarios, breaking away from stereotypes and prejudices that has been wrongfully created regarding the concept of what is global. Internationalization is a part of administrating universities and is without doubt a trend in higher education. Internationalization is a part of university management and without a doubt is a trend in higher education. It is always important to ask ourselves, what is the purpose behind inter internationalization? Why do we do it? The answer may be depend on the nature of each institution, on the intensity that each, each one assigns to it, we may use it solely to recruit new students. Our objective may be to fulfill standards relative to quality assurance processes. It may be to strengthen our institution in academic terms or just for the mobility of students and professors. The importance of this reflection is to outline the actions and strategies to be implemented and the answer to these questions. We either have them or are working on them. I would like to skip some of the slides but go to the state of internationalization in Latin America. This year, the Regional Observatory on Internationalization and Tertiary Education Network of UNESCO released the first regional survey on trends of internationalization of tertiary education in Latin America and the Caribbean. The survey collected the answers of 377 institutions of 22 countries of the region. Of course, this is not the first survey and it's not the only one. But I use it as a reference because it's the most recent and I'm sure that the results are conclusive and interesting for the panel since they allow us to know the points of view of our region and what we want us of integration with our, seven, uh, with our regions. Briefly, I'm going to share some of the, find, uh, the findings that will also allow us to identify where we can develop collaboration liaisons. Main benefits of internationalization for the universities of this study, develop the international profile of students, is the first one. Second, improve the academic quality of education programs. And third, strengthen the internationaliz uh, internationalization of the curriculum. Main external factors of this study driving internationalization in the universities in South America are in Latin America, government policies, the first one, regional policies, the third one, inter international cooperation offers. The fourth one, search for alternative funding, demand of the production sector, and global university rankings. The risk of internationalization for the universities in this survey, <coughs> uh, the first risk is international opportunities benefits students with economic resources. 
benefits disparities among partners, and mostly benefits an elite of scholars. Main institutional obstacles for internationalization. The first one is insufficient funding, insufficient proficiency in foreign languages of students and faculty, and the third one, administrative and bureaucratic burdens. And the last part is the priority regions for this internationalization is Western Europe is the first destiny, Latin America and the Caribbean is the second, the third one is North America, the fourth Asia and Eastern Union. The main internationalization activities we have is student mobility 97%, mobility of scholars 88%, participation in development international cooperation 68%, and development of joint and double programs with foreign institutions. And I will stop it because I, I have more slides of what we are doing in mobility, but time is ended. Just a quick reminder, uh, most of the presentations will be on the IFCU website uh, after the General Assembly, so if you wish to delve in a little deeper, then you'll have access to the PowerPoints or to the text, uh, and so we'll honor your contributions that way. The, the other point is that six universities have not voted yet. Prochain uh, intervenant, Dr. Herminio V. Dagohoy, président de ASEACU et recteur de San Thomas University. Okay, good morning. I would not allow Chantal to cut me, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ASEACU is so diverse and so varied, so this presentation is definitely, uh, would not capture the the diversity of the, the region, which is actually composed of Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, have I, Australia, and uh, the most recent, uh, Cambodia. So this is just to highlight our undertaking in the university. So, uh, just a little bit of promotion. So, University of Santo Tomas is a 35,000. We have 35,000 students with 2,000 faculties, 800 staff. Uh, we have 408 international students taking full-time course in the in the university. This number does not include the exchange students, those who are in the university for one month, two months, or three months exposure. We don't have first-year and second-year students in the Philippines, so these are practically those who are staying with us for the past three years. So we have 100 undergraduate programs, 49 masters, and 22 doctoral degree offerings in the university. Uh, we have four-star rated uh, university and part of the 200 uh, best universities in Asia. This is our brand. And our internationalization is informed by 407 years of uh, existence, our vision of values of Catholic institution. Uh, we educate our students to be leaders in these particular areas, and uh, we provide them learning environment that would actually provide them uh, and expose them to research, innovation, and engagement in social community extension services. As a pontifical and Catholic university in Asia, the UST opens its door to deserving students from all faith uh, traditions. Now, <clears throat> we understand internationalization as not only as a matter of mobility. Internationalization of our students means that our students should understand the global context or the environment within which they live, study, and work, and that they should be adept and comfortable in living and working in a global environment. With the looming ASEAN integration and the need for our students and faculty to be in touch with the rest of the Asian region and the rest of the world, Internationalization should also be, there should be an internationalization at home because not all our students could afford to go elsewhere. And that is very important. So what are our strategies? So let me summarize our strategies or approaches into four process, activity, competency, and ethos. Uh, integration of an international intercultural dimension into teaching, innovation, and research. This is very important because our curricula and activities should be imbued with international or intercultural inputs. So our students 
do not need to go elsewhere. Some of those who can afford can, but those who remain should have understand, uh, a clear understanding of what internationalization should be. And this process is articulated into different activities. Our curricula is definitely uh, being re-engineered to have uh, that dimension. The research program, students exchange, faculty, technical assistance, and uh, the presence of our international students. This internationalization should also be translated into competencies and skills that our students should have, our professors should exercise, and our own staff. And last but not the least, and I think very important to mention, we should cultivate an ethos of international undertaking in our university. And so many activities and definitely programs and procedures in our respective universities should reflect that kind of international ethos. Example of our student mobility programs, we have sandwich program, meaning to say our students can study one year abroad and finish this program in the Philippines for another three years. We have research attachments, internship, language, some programs, study programs, and disciplinary specific exchanges. Yes. So, now I'm going to the challenges because this is very important. The challenge of internationalization should, our challenges are the need to create an enabling environment on internationalization on top down and bottom up support. It's very important. Engaging the faculty in a continuous sustainable development program on internationalization. Our faculty should be aware of that. Second, fidelity to the implementation. It couldn't change one year and then another year you have another one. Establishing research-driven cutting-edge curricular programs and potential for attracting a significant number of international talents. So, with the past five years, we have seen how our professors are engaged in different uh, programs in research, so much so that uh, we have quite a number of uh, cross-border fundings from different agencies, and we have a very good number of collaborators in research undertakings. So thank you very much. Next and last presenter, Dr. Michael galgan uh, president of ACCU. Good morning. <clears throat> I have uh, three major points to advance. One, some facts. Uh, number two, some challenges and opportunities. And number three, um, how to advance global engagement with your schools and the schools within the United States, if that's of interest. So some simple facts, point one. Um, if um, on the screen you will find um, a dozen, uh, you, you'll see a fast facts page. It's two pages long. It basically says that a million students go from the United States out and 300,000 students come in. Uh, but in Catholic colleges, uh, about um, the majority of our 250 schools have students come in and come out. Our Catholic universities uh, do this at a higher rate than our publics and our other faith-based schools. Um, and um, of note, we have schools that excel in having students come in and students that excel at students going out. And this uh, short uh, monograph spells that out. So for example, the leading schools would be Fordham, Georgetown, and DePaul, or University of San Francisco going, uh, ha accepting students, the largest number. But those students that, those campuses that send students in the other direction would be University of San Diego, University of Notre Dame, Loyola, Maryland, um, University of Dayton, uh, George, Georgetown University. So, 
students coming in and going out at our schools is different, just like everywhere else in the world. But we have 250. Um, and you can find these fast, fast fact pages on our website, and there's a dozen of them about our schools. This one happens to be the one on internationalization. Number two, challenges and opportunities. Uh, I would agree with my colleagues. Uh, the number one challenge, especially with mobility, is the finances. In the United States, there has been a significant change in methodology and how we export our students. So please note this, that many of our universities now are actually creating campuses off-site to export their students there rather than partnering with schools like yours. And this is significantly because this is, this is a significant change because the university then can control the money and the degree program in more ways than if they do the interaction. And this is not good news uh, in terms of partnering but I have to be honest with you, it is the latest trend that I see with our schools. They don't even work together well in the United States in these exporting adventures. They, um, so, uh, uh, the challenge here obviously is financial, both in uh, a faculty coming and going and students coming and going and the exchange rate, et cetera. So that is far and away the number one challenge. Uh, but the benefits are rich when they can happen well, being exposing students, exposing faculty to the beauty and the, the grandeur of God's creation worldwide, the wonder and uh, uh, the, 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 the enrichment that happens by, by gaining one another's culture, and understanding how people of faith around the globe manifest that in different ways. Uh, third point, uh, if you want to advance global engagement with schools in the United States, um, I would strongly recommend that you think well past uh, the MOU model that has been used often. And I have to say that at least once a month, I get an email or a phone call from some school like one of yours that wants to come to the United States and engage with our office and to help be a bridge to our schools. So it's a common factor about what I'm about to talk about. I would suggest that you think much more past an MOU. Uh, there's actually a five or six key um, dimensions that our schools look for when they look to partner. Um, a clear articulation commitment by the, your school that it's more than just the rector or the president. Second, that there's, a, there's necessary staffing on your campus so that when students were to go from our campus to your campus or vice versa, that both parties would feel comfortable. Third, that the curriculum and the learning objectives are actually going to benefit the students' mobility and the students' career path. Uh, uh, fourth, that faculty policies or practices as they, we do a swapping exercise are in place in an appropriate way. Uh, Fifth, that student mobility is possible by visas, et cetera. I'm often surprised that people are not aware of some of the blocks that will happen if they match with our schools before they even try to set something up. So having some foresight about that is really important. Uh, all done. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll, uh, to all the panelists for sharing your experiences, we'll now gather the next uh, panel. So where's Brother Bray, my, my buddy? There, OK. So uh, where's your team? Come on, come on up, speakers. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Good morning. Um, I'm Brother Peter Bray. I'm the Vice Chancellor at Bethlehem University, originally from New Zealand, uh, and have been for the last 10 years at uh, Bethlehem University. Because of time restraints, what we're going to do is uh, there are only four of us uh, in this panel. Uh, that what we'll do, each of us will introduce ourselves, say something about our university, and then uh, highlight some challenges. And we'll take about eight minutes each, and then uh, there'll be some time, hopefully, at the end for some questions. So as people are speaking, if you jot down some questions, you might like to ask them. So we'll start at the, just follow along, start at the far end, Father, if you could start with yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, George Nkeze Jingwa is my name. I, I always give. So George Nkeze Jingwa is my name. Uh, I always give thanks to the solutions. Professor Mario is there. Uh, they trained me in education. I would like to talk about uh, Catholic universities in precarious and uncertain and difficult political landscape. The case of the the Catholic University Institute of Boya, Cameroon. Um, Cameroon is known as Africa in one country, beautiful country, beautiful. This is known for its soccer, its soccer team. Roger Miller, you all know Roger Miller. It's very bilingual, English and French. The students are expected to know both languages. Uh, there are 200 tribes in Cameroon, 200 tribes, 200 different languages. So you're expected to know about four languages. You have, you have mother tongue, English, French, and pidgin. Which is, which is the lingua franca of Cameroon. So a typical Cameroonian will have to know four languages. It's a country of 23 million, rich in uh, resources. Uh, the president, Paul Biya, age 85, is still president, 36 years old as president. He still wants to run this October for another, another seven years. That will take him to more than 90 years as president. Uh, the country is... Uh, is run by a 5% elderly, and 60% of the population are youthful. So I'm just trying to give you a background of the challenges that we face in a political structure that is like where just 5% of the elderly are running that structure, and 60% are young people. Unemployment rate is 54%. Uh, it's, it's ranked as one of the most corrupt countries in the world, unfortunately. Uh, so there's, there's a general frustration among the young people because of the leadership. Now. Where do we come in as a university? Uh, we have, it's, it's a diocesan university founded in 2010 by the bishop, Emmanuel Bushu, as a response to the frustration of billions of young people in Cameroon. Uh, the whole focus is on entrepreneurship, which is, as you all know, it's a vocation. Entrepreneurship is a vocation. The document, the political document on the vocation of business leader is very good at place that. Uh, it's a mindset. And also, you have to do business. So all our students have to do business in all the disciplines. They have to be entrepreneurial. Whether in agriculture, engineering, they have to do business. Their passion is their passion. The goal is to help them to be owners of their own development. I think that's a way forward to address poverty and misery at the roots in Africa. The idea of aid is not helping. It goes again through the top, and it doesn't go to the bottom. So this model begins from the bottom to the top, empowering the young people to be job creators instead of job seekers. This is the, this is the goal for Africa. And we teach our students, we, they are agripreneurs, spiritpreneurs, what about Catholic studies, stempreneurs, technopreneurs, that's, that's our goal. Nothing else, but nothing more. Um, now, this is what is happening with, with a, a landscape that uh, in 2016, there was a revolution. The English-speaking part of Cameroon uh, decided to secede. So this is where the challenge has come. Uh, it, started, it started as a lawyer's movement, and then went to schools. And there, there was a strong agenda of no school. So for two years, no school. There have been a strong agenda, no school for two years. 
The argument is that why should kids go to school when there's no future? So they had a lot of support, no school. And so a good amount of schools have to close down in the English-speaking region. Uh, the burn down schools, if you open your schools, they come to you and burn down your school. So it has been a tough times. They attack kids who are going to school, students, lecturers, administrators going to school. Why do you have to go to school? There's no reason going to school. The internet was shut down by the government for four months. Uh, the, so the entire revolution is driven by a strong social media war. The media has played a very strong role uh, in this revolution. And so Cameroon is at the brink of a civil war. This is what's happening now. You see what's happening. They have all the young people have all taken up arms. You know, you see, they're all now in the forest. Militias attacking and fighting the government. They want to own their land by force. So it's, a, it's kind of a challenging time uh, to see young people with all the energy they have. They're going to the forest and picking up arms. Again, this, this, these arms are sold from the West. You know, this is, this, this is where we have the challenge. And they are cleaning themselves. We are cleaning ourselves now in Cameroon. Uh, look at what, so families are displaced. You see families are displaced. They treat, we call that ghost, sorry. They call this uh, ghost town, where nobody comes out. When the militia says nobody's out for the next two days, nobody goes out. Imagine the whole of Menuth, nobody goes out for two, three days. We call them ghost towns. That's how the uh, towns are. So the kids cannot go to school. Because if you go out, you're attacked. So the streets are all empty. You see, they're all, if you come out, you're killed, you're attacked. You see, the government has, is fighting the, 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 the young people. Those young people, nine years old with guns, 10 years old with guns, the government is trying to clamp down on them. It's so difficult now because the, the landscape has changed. Social media is carrying it everywhere. So the landscape has changed. So this is, I'm sorry. Yes, OK. No, what's happening? It's not going on. It's not going anywhere. So the, the, I don't know what, OK. All right, so that's, that's two more minutes. So that is the landscape social media war. Kidnapping take place, very common. Everybody, you, if you, you are against them, they pick you up, they kidnap for ransom. So that is the reality. So what is the effect of this? The effect of this shows 300,000 refugees now, destruction of entire villages, uh, students cannot go to school, parents don't pay fees anymore, there's loss of trust, enrollments in our schools have dropped. We had 2,500, now it's 700, it might drop to 200. You never know what can happen. Very uncertain. Now, what is, what is our position? We feel that in this crisis, CUIB did not give up the spirit. We must run schools. We had to be bold as Catholic, to be non-partisan and a political stand. We had to stand strong and tell the world and the, all both sides that students need to learn. The future for Africa is to train young entrepreneurs. To deny them that opportunity is to create more sufferings for the young. So we went on in the very tough circumstances. We blocked the school. We bring them in in the night, in the early in the morning. We, they don't walk out, they don't walk in groups. So we had strategies to keep the students in school for them to learn. They need to learn. And so we had new strategies in campus, uh, got some peoples not going to school. The peoples that could not go to school, what we did was we brought them together and started an elementary school to train them as people, people entrepreneurs. Kids of two years, three years, so we had to start an elementary school. Train people entrepreneurs because that's the way forward. Let them be owners of their own destiny, of their own future. That is the way forward for Africa, not aid, not aid. So last, so this is the school, which you see, we see what we are doing. In, in the midst of that crisis, we went on. Because some parents want their children to go to school, and we succeeded to get some of them. And that is it. And so how do we keep hope alive? Can, can if could be a source of mediation? I don't know. Uh, but I think the goal, the goal now is how do we use technology to help uh, these young people learn? I think that is the challenge that we will share. So we need more suggestions from you. We are open. I'm open to any suggestions. How do we run schools in such a climate? How do we run schools in such a climate where it's so uncertain that some days the streets are not that they're empty? They, 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 they may declare that this week no school. Or sometimes in school, they attack the schools. So how do you run schools in such a system? We are ready to go on. We are not giving up. Thank you.
Voilà, moi je suis euh, innocent Nirinde Kwe. Je viens de Goma, de la République démocratique du Congo. Je suis recteur d'une très très jeune université de 7 ans seulement, qui est née en 2011 et qui a diplômé ses premiers lauréats il y a une année seulement. Donc, euh, nous sommes là heureux de pouvoir apprendre, écouter et essayer de comprendre aussi comment les autres ont fait en face de ceux qui ont déjà fait peut-être plus de 500 ans. Nous nous trouvons des petits. L'université catholique La Sapiencia de Goma est née dans un contexte qui a deux aspects. C'est d'abord les parents des enfants qui ont demandé à l'église. Parce que on s'est rendu compte que la plupart des enfants qui allaient en supérieur, c'était des enfants qui se perdaient à cause d'un déficit intellectuel, éthique et moral dans les universités publiques, souvent, à cause de la corruption. Alors les parents ont demandé à l'église. Le deuxième motif, c'était le fait que nous sommes dans une zone au conflit récurrent, beaucoup de guerres, nous sommes à l'est du Congo, à la frontière avec le Rwanda depuis ce qui s'est passé au Rwanda en 94, il y a comme un effet de boomerang vers le Congo. Il y a eu de l'insécurité qui s'est généralisée et donc beaucoup de jeunes ont, comme au Cameroun, intégré les groupes armés et il fallait trouver des solutions pour les réintégrer dans les écoles. Et le diocèse, pour les deux motifs, a dit « D'accord, la mission de l'éducation n'est pas secondaire pour moi ». C'est une mission prioritaire et donc en 2011, on a commencé cette école. Voilà donc la raison. Euh, ici, nous sommes euh, presque entre deux, deux imaginaires. Je me sens presque coincé entre l'imaginaire de la grandeur, de la puissance, de la réussite euh, que j'ai regardé depuis le début dans les grandes présentations et un imaginaire un peu de la petitesse, de l'enfance, comme quelqu'un a dit, le Rwandais, quand il a dit « il y a des grands et il y a des nains ». Mais je crois que nous sommes dans la, même, dans la même mission. Je me représente une maman qui envoie trois enfants euh, puisés, parce que je viens de l'Afrique, puisés dans un ruisseau. Il leur donne trois petits bidons. Au premier, l'aîné qui a 18 ans, il lui donne un petit bidon de de 15 litres et au deuxième un bidon de 8 litres et à un troisième un bidon de 3 litres quand tous ces enfants arrivent à la maison maman ne va pas coter positivement celui qui a amené euh, le, le 15 litres mais je crois que les, tous les trois enfants chacun a amené comme il peut et je crois que pour nous c'est important euh, le souci de penser qu'on est encore petit peut-être ça va nous aider à grandir en regardant ce que les autres font le deuxième point, ce sont les défis. D'abord, un défi majeur. Le défi majeur, c'est le non-accès aux biens de la science, aux biens de la technologie, aux biens du développement, aux biens de l'innovation. C'est ça le, le problème fondamental, je crois. Ne pas accéder comme les autres, n'est-ce pas, à ces biens de la science. Ne pas avoir la possibilité d'y accéder. Et les défis spécifiques, le premier naturellement, c'est celui de la formation de nos formateurs. En tant que jeune université, nous recourons, comme les autres ont dit, à la mobilité et cela coûte beaucoup. Et donc, il faut trouver des moyens pour former des professeurs, des enseignants et des chercheurs. Le deuxième défi, c'est le défi de la recherche. On ne peut pas faire de la recherche quand on n'a pas les outils techniques et les outils matériels qu'il faut. Imaginez que dans mon université, qui est âgée de 7, 7 ans, nous allumons les générateurs, comme on appelle chez nous les groupes électriques, de 8 heures à 18 heures, parce qu'il n'y a pas d'électricité. C'est très, très difficile. Deuxièmement, nous n'avons pas d'Internet. Nous utilisons l'Internet seulement avec les SIM cards ou avec ce qu'on appelle les modems. C'est très rare que vous avez un Wi-Fi qui fonctionne et donc vous, vous voyez qu'accéder 
à ce que j'ai appelé les biens de la science et de la technologie, ça devient un problème terrible. Troisième euh, difficulté ou défi, ce sont les infrastructures. Il faut construire, même s'il faut y aller doucement. Nous avons un principe de gradualité pragmatique. On ne peut pas vouloir grand quand on est encore petit. Nous nous disons qu'il faut y aller doucement. Mais donc, il faut construire parce que les étudiants, les, 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 les apprenants doivent avoir des conditions d'études assez normales. Quatrième défi, qui est le dernier, c'est le défi d'équipement et de bibliothèque. Parce qu'effectivement, si vous, vous imaginez une université qui a moins de 50 ordinateurs, c'est un défi majeur. Donc, on est petit, mais on pense qu'on peut grandir. Alors, troisième point, euh, peut-être par rapport la concrétisation de la solidarité. Parce que nous sommes dans le panel qui, qui regarde les défis et la solidarité. Je parle d'une sagesse africaine parce que nous aimons euh, des sagesses. Dans ma culture, on dit que là où il n'y a pas la mauvaise volonté, la peau du plus petit animal peut se couvrir, peut couvrir plusieurs personnes. Imaginez si vous prenez un petit lapin, vous lui enlevez la peau, si vous voulez couvrir toute la salle parce que vous avez l'amour et la générosité, alors vous pouvez couvrir toute la salle. La peau du plus petit animal, là où il y a la générosité et, la, et le partage, la valeur horizontale de, de, du partage, alors tout le monde peut réellement avoir l'abondance parce que le Seigneur nous appelle à la vie et à la vie en abondance. Donc, pour concrétiser, des petites choses concrètes. Moi, je me dis si quelqu'un, parce qu'il ne s'agit pas seulement que, nous, que le plus petit ou celui qui est pauvre, quelqu'un a parlé de la pauvreté ou du manque, si ça doit être simplement toujours lui qui va demander, évidemment, il va ennuyer. Mais si l'aîné, le, le grand frère, prend conscience qu'il y a un petit frère qui a besoin de petites choses, alors l'aîné peut lui dire, mais petit, nous aimons dire ça chez nous, nous aimons utiliser les mots petit et grand pour dire l'aîné est le plus petit. Petit, tu as besoin de quoi Moi j'ai un ordinateur que je n'utilise pas. J'ai un laboratoire de ceci ou de cela ou un atelier. Moi je dois tout changer. Voilà, je vais te les donner, est-ce que ça peut te servir J'ai une bibliothèque que je vais larguer. Est-ce que la bibliothèque peut te servir yeah. Tu as des, besoin des ouvrages Voilà des exemples. Oui, je vais terminer. Donc, c'est possible. La deuxième chose pour concrétiser, c'est de dire, quand je dis nous avons le plus grand défi, la formation, c'est de dire, moi, dans mon université, au lieu d'attendre la FIUC, moi, dans ma région, je peux accueillir un assistant, deux assistants, deux jeunes, dans mon université, qu'ils viennent être formés et qu'ils rentrent. Ou alors je peux mobiliser les enseignants de mon université pour faire, comme le collègue disait, une association sans frontières des, des professeurs pour venir aider. Voilà des petits exemples que je donne et je crois que ça peut toucher tous les domaines pour dire, effectivement, si on veut partager, on peut le faire. Mais il ne faut pas attendre toujours que ce soit l'autre qui demande, mais si on est conscient qu'on est dans la catholicité, alors c'est possible. Et je termine en me posant une question quelle est la part de nos églises dans l'accompagnement de la FIUC Est-ce que les conférences épiscopales, est-ce que nos diocèses, parce qu'il y a des conférences épiscopales qui ont trop de moyens. J'ai été content d'entendre que la CHEI a financé. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas d'autres conférences épiscopales qui ont les moyens et d'autres diocèses qui ont des moyens et d'autres fondations qui ont des moyens qui peuvent effectivement accompagner Ça, c'est l'avant-dernière la la, la, la question. La dernière, thank, thank effectivement... Nous demandons aux aînés d'avoir cet intérêt, de regarder et de dire que ce que nous pouvons faire pour vous. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Stephen Rasha, and I'm the vice chancellor of the Catholic University in Erbil, in northern Iraq. And I think you have before you in this panel the, the panel of chaos. Uh, whose reality is quite different, I think, than uh, many of uh, the rest of you here. And, and, and so I'm very grateful to have a chance to speak to you, and especially honored to speak after my brothers, who I, I, I 
we are with you. We are in the same place. Um, the history of our university, I think we are the youngest and the smallest uh, and the poorest and, and most likely, uh, along with my brothers here, the most endangered uh, university that uh, is at this conference. We look at that as a blessing, and I'll tell you why a, a little bit later on. Um, as our history, uh, we were born in the middle of the war, the ISIS war, uh, with a generous grant from the Italian Catholic uh, Bishops Conference uh, that came to us, about two million euros, um, that enabled us to open up a, a university for the displaced Christians of northern Iraq from Mosul and Nineveh primarily. Over 150,000 of them were uh, violently chased from their homes by ISIS. Uh, and most of them ended up in the Archdiocese of Erbil, and because of a massive failure in international aid, uh, these Christians, these displaced Christians, uh, became uh, almost exclusively the wards of the church. Um, and uh, in this time, we had to make decisions on what we would do with these, uh, with these young people especially so that they did not lose all of these critical years of their lives. And so again, with the help of the Italian Bishops' Conference, we were open, able to open a, a small university, uh, which we did in the middle of the war. And at the time that we finished uh, constructing the buildings and were prepared to open, we thought we were at a static point in the war um, in which we'd have some breathing space to open. Uh, but then uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, resumption of the war uh, and the retaking of Mosul and Nineveh began again. The fighting again began in earnest. Uh, the situation became more difficult again. And so for these last three or four years, we've been in a, in a place of stop and start and stop and start. Uh, nevertheless, we are uh, determined to continue. And I'll tell you, tell you why that is. Uh, the Christians of Iraq in 2003, there were about 1.5 million. Uh, Christians still in Iraq in 2003. Today, by uh, any realistic uh, account, there are less than 200,000. Uh, the church in Iraq is no longer an established church, uh, but is in fact a, a missionary church. Uh, but the, uh, the, the Christians that do remain, and at the heart of them is the Catholic Church, the Christians of Iraq are predominantly Catholic, about 85% of them uh, Catholic. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the status of that remaining group uh, is very uh, sincerely believing that they are now a missionary church with a role, with a role in the Middle East to show the, the, the Christian teaching, the Christian, the, 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 the Christian spirit can remain there. Our Christian witness, despite all of this persecution, all of this horrendous violence, that the Christian witness has a place to remain. Historically in Iraq and in the Middle East, the Christians have held two primary areas, and that's education and health care. And we think these are, are, are two areas where the Christian witness can remain in Iraq regardless of the situation. Uh, regardless of how few of us are left, uh, there is still a, 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 a rightful place for us in these two fields. So the Catholic University of Erbil then, where are we? We are uh, officially recognized by the Ministry of Higher Education uh, in both Baghdad and in, in Erbil. Uh, for those of you who have familiarity with Iraq, there's an autonomous region in uh, northern Iraq, the Kurdistan Autonomous Region. They have their own government in Erbil. There's another government, the federal government in Baghdad. Uh, they're in conflict with each other quite often, and we have to deal with both of them. Uh, we are in Erbil, so we have to get uh, uh, approval from both sides, and oftentimes they don't uh, speak with each other or recognize each other, and we're in this, in this environment Nevertheless, our university has approval from both ministries of higher education. 
we're approved both as a, uh, an institution of higher education and learning and also a research institution. So uh, in the short time that I, I have for you today, and I'm happy to speak with, uh, with any of you uh, afterwards, but we have two requests, two things that we're looking for in, in our uh, effort to, to remain alive and, and remain uh, valid and, and useful. Uh, the two things that uh, we're looking for is help in training our faculty. Uh, it's one thing to have foreign faculty come in for three months or six months or, or, or whatever, but it's no way to build a university for a long term. We need to develop indigenous local faculty, and this is what we're trying to do. For this reason, we are looking for partners within the Catholic University uh, world that will take our qualified students and uh, assist them and take them in as scholarship students in obtaining their higher degrees, their master's degrees, their doctorate degrees. These are students that are fully vetted by the archdiocese. They come with the personal guarantee of the archbishop that we will return them, that these are, uh, these are mature students who are going out for a mission, who believe in our mission to be educated and then return to us. We've had success with this so far. We've had seven students go to the Catholic University in Australia, and I know you're here someplace. Thank you very much. I hope I, I get a chance to see you before this is over. But seven students have gone to the Catholic University in Australia and returned. We have two student, students at the University of Dallas, a Catholic university in the U.S., uh, that uh, are there now, a husband and a wife team getting their masters and, and PhDs. We've just uh, uh, had uh, students accepted at the Franciscan University of Steubenville uh, in the U.S. as well. And so we're looking to establish these sorts of relationships. Our language of instruction is in English, so that is uh, an important thing for us. But if your universities are such that you think you might have space for these types of students, uh, we would very much like to speak with you. The, the second thing that we're doing is as a research as a research institute, uh, we uh, are establishing uh, uh, institutes of uh, religious freedom and an institute of cultural preservation. These are opportunities for established scholars to come into Iraq and help us. If your schools have any such scholars and you'd like to discuss that, I'm happy to speak with you as well. Thank you very much for your time. It would be very easy to get a sense of despair after listening to these, but I think one of the things that is very central to what we're on about as Christian uni and Catholic universities is the hope that is at the very heart of our faith. And I think uh, at Bethlehem University, one of our biggest challenges is to keep hope alive. And I would suspect that it would be exactly the same for these. Bethlehem University was started in 1973 in the midst of the Yom Kippur War, and thank you, <laughs> I haven't started. <laughs> um, and uh, it started with 112 students. Uh, it emerged out of the visit to, to uh, Palestine and the Holy Land of uh, Pope Paul VI in 1964. But it wasn't until Archbishop Pialagi, the apostolic delegate, took up the challenge in 1972 uh, to get the university started, and it started in 1973. I often wonder, in uh, December 1972, the decision was made to start the university. In October 1973, it opened. I'm just thinking, you know, the process that had have to be gone through now to start a university is quite extraordinary. So we have, a, a, at present, we have 3,200 students. Of those, 24% uh, are Christian and 76% are Muslim. And uh, we have 78% of the students are women. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful way in which we're contributing to Bethlehem, uh, to Palestine. My concern is the trend. Uh, when I went there, it was 68%, and now it's grown to 78%. I just like to make the point, it's not because I'm there that all the women are coming, but I think the, the trend, you know, if we got into the 80% or 85%, it could very easily become an all-boys uh, university, which we don't want. 
We have five faculties, uh, business, education, science, nursing and arts, and uh, an Institute of Hotel Management and Tourism. What I'd like to spend some time on, though, are the challenges that we face there. There are three areas I'd like to touch on. Firstly, the political challenges, the academic challenges, and the religious challenges. I'm sure you're all aware that Bethlehem University in Palestine exists under occupation. Uh, the colonization that uh, Israel is uh, pursuing is having significant impact on us. The one restriction that impacts most on our students is the restriction on movement. We have 46% of our students coming from East Jerusalem, which means they have to come through the wall each day to, uh, to uh, Bethlehem University. And the, the students who are in Palestine ha are uh, unable to go into Israel um, except with uh, specific permission of the Israeli military. That has huge implications for us uh, as far as movement is concerned and our, our curriculum. We have a program on religious studies which looks at Islam, Christianity and Judaism in the Holy Land where the three of them sort of start. And we can't take our uh, Muslim students into Alaska Mosque. We can't take so many of our Christian students into the Holy Sepulchre or up into, into the Galilee. And that restricts us in the way in which we can carry out our uh, our programs uh, around religious studies. I think the other uh, implication of uh, the occupation is the economic one. Israel controls the economy in, uh, in Palestine, particularly in Jerusalem, in uh, Bethlehem. And as a result, uh, in Bethlehem, the unemployment rate is around 24, 25%. For young people under 26, it's up in the 40%. So, one of the things that is a real challenge for us is keeping people motivated, keeping people with hope that there is point in what they are doing. And I think uh, the standing of Bethlehem University in Palestine, it's, with all due humility, it's the best university there. And so people who graduate from Bethlehem University have a much better opportunity of getting a job uh, because of, of that background. What we are trying to do is we're working with uh, universities outside uh, Palestine, uh, Indiana University in particular. We have developed a, uh, a business incubator, uh, which is uh, centered at Bethlehem University, but it is for Bethlehem, it's not just for our students, helping people not, not just get jobs, but to create jobs. And that's beginning to have an impact. And we're fortunate with the funding uh, to enable that to happen. Academically, I think one of our biggest challenges is, as has been mentioned before, uh, getting qualified faculty. We are restricted in uh, the visas that Israel will uh, allow uh, foreigners to have. It's a three-month visa, which is not a, a semester. So we can't employ foreign uh, uh, academics. And that means that uh, our, the pool of people from which we can draw our faculty is very, very limited. And we're very, very fortunate that there are universities, uh, particularly in the, in the United States and England, who are taking our graduates, one university, and our, this is one of the brothers' university, uh, at Lewis University in Chicago, for almost 30 years now has taken one of our graduates, put them through a master's program at their expense on the condition that they come back and teach with us. And that has had a huge impact on the availability of qualified people at Bethlehem University. So we're, we're limited in our ability to attract um, foreign uh, academics, but our master's program in international cooperation is done in a module system. So we are able for that to bring people in from around the world uh, to teach there. One of the other things that I'm concerned about is the uh, lack of diversity among our students. We're not allowed to have international students. We're not allowed to have students from Israel. Uh, and, and so they're all Palestinians. And I think that is a, uh, a disadvantage for them. Fortunately, we're, we have a number of um, uh, endowments which enable us to send uh, 
our students outside and we, for about uh, seven, eight years now, about a dozen of our students have gone to the United States in the summer uh, for internships there. We have uh, people going to, to uh, Melbourne uh, in Australia for uh, internships there. So that's uh, a, a huge thing because many of our students from the West Bank have never been outside Palestine. Uh, there's this famous uh, story, which I won't go into great detail about, about one of our 22-year-old students who happened to mention to a group of uh, pilgrims that he'd never set eyes on the sea, which is about 30 kilometres away. So they're locked into this area uh, that has huge impact on the way in which they can benefit from uh, the education we offer. The third challenge we have is uh, a religious one. Uh, in Palestine, less than 2%, it's closer to 1% of the population are Christian. Uh, and one of the reasons Bethlehem University was founded was to support the Christians in Palestine. So we have uh, at Bethlehem University 24% of our students as Christians. And this is a, a significant way in which we're reaching out to support these people not only to give them education, but to provide them with an opportunity so that they can stay there and, and be part of the Christian community uh, in, in Palestine. One of the things that uh, we are very conscious of is that in keeping 24% of our population Christian, we are obviously uh, giving preference to Christians, and I have no qualms about doing that whatsoever. In doing that, it means that those Christian students are supported. They're not isolated little individuals in a sea of Muslim students. There's support there for them. The reverse of it, though, is that with that number of Christians, it's impossible for our Muslim students to be there and not engage with Christians. And many, if not most, of our students from Hebron have never met a Christian until they come to Bethlehem University. And I think one of the significant contributions Bethlehem University is making is providing that opportunity. Now, many people have asked me, what is an unashamedly Catholic university doing in a country where there's only about 1% of the population Christian? And my response is, if you go back 2,000 years to when Jesus started his ministry there, there were no Christians there at all then. So what was he doing? And if you go to chapter 10 of John's Gospel, verse 10, I have come, why? I have come that they may have life, life in all its fullness. That's what Jesus was on about. But that's exactly what Bethlehem University is on about. Whether they be Christians or Muslims or no faith at all, what we are doing is creating an atmosphere, developing an environment, providing an opportunity for our students to gain the knowledge, to acquire the skills, to develop the virtues and whatever that's going to enable them to live life as fully as they possibly can. And I think one of the challenges that we have as a, an organisation in IFCU, and you'd notice that one of the things uh, in the, the title of this uh, conference is about solidarity. And I'd like to make the point to finish that solidarity is not about charity. It's not about trying to help her. No, as Desmond Tutu says, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have taken the side of the oppressor. Thank you. Okay, we have about five minutes, uh, and I, uh, if you have any questions to any of the four of us, uh, please feel free to ask them now. We have our microphone down here, please. In the front row. Oh, no, this one here. She's coming. Thank you so much for your testimonies. It was very impressive. And uh, I would like, in Erbil, in Iraq, in your university, what are the disciplines that you are developing? So, in, in Iraq, we, we suffer from the uh, educational system that was bequeathed to us by Saddam, 
which he inherited from the Russians. And uh, so that any discipline that we want to, uh, uh, and any course that we want to put in place has to be approved first by the Ministry of Higher Education. Um, and it's quite a process, but right now we have disciplines approved. I'll try to remember all of them off, of, off the top of my head, but uh, they're, they're approaching the standard uh, liberal arts uh, uh, courses that you would have in the West. So we have uh, languages, English, Arabic. Uh, we have uh, a business, business administration, economics, uh, intellectual uh, property, and uh, information technology. We have uh, Oriental Studies, which is an umbrella, uh, organ uh, umbrella uh, department for us under which we can put uh, religion and theology. We cannot call it that overtly, so we do it as Oriental, Oriental Studies. Um, we have uh, International Relations um, uh, and, and uh, several of the sciences as well. So we have a website which you, if, you, if you Google us, Catholic University in Arabiel, and it lists all of those. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions down the back? My name is Sofia Opatska. I come from Ukrainian Catholic University and uh, be, I'm also from the country where we have war and a lot of challenges and um, it's something between comment and question to all of you. Um, in countries which have big problems and, as you have mentioned, chaos, um, very often there are very high expectations to Catholic universities or as a hope, you know, because we really become a place of hope. And so very many people come and they say they have plenty of ideas of new programs. They have plenty of suggestions to us how we can help the society. But at the same time, we typically have lack of resources. We are small, we need to be focused. And, and I don't know, from my experience, it's very difficult to communicate back to the society that we cannot solve all the problems. And though we are so important in our country, still there should be some other institutions. So maybe my question is, how do you cooperate with other stakeholders? How do you solve this issue for yourself? I think you're, you're right. But I think the focus should be on empowering the, the, the few that you have. Christ did not solve all. Did not, did not, Christ did not solve all the problems of the poor. They were still poor in, in Israel. We have to do the ones we can do. Empower them to be owners of their own development. I think we should not feel we, could, we can change the whole world. But we can change ourselves first. Uh, having the, the, the right vision, the right, the right attitude. And once they see the right attitude, you give them hope. Even some of those who don't have jobs or who don't, cannot go to school. When we have the right vision, and we train a generation of young people who don't see the crisis as negative, but as an opportunity to grow. See, the, 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 the danger I see is that we start making as if they are, they are the worst of, of the world. No, we have to make them still that dignity of the human person in the midst of the crisis to be positive, uh, 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 focus on the, the ones you can. Those ones will spread slowly, as he said, as brother said, Christ started with 12, it goes. So for me, this is the approach. Thank you. Thank you. you. Any of them? I think one of the things uh, that I've sort of been very aware of in terms of hope, in trying to keep hope alive, that hope is different uh, to optimism. Uh, because uh, from my perspective, when the Palestinians look back over the last 60 or so years, there's very, very little that would lead them to be optimistic. So my struggle was, well, what's this hope thing about? And one of the things I've become very aware of in the last 10 years is that for our students to be aware that there are people outside their situation who have some understanding of what they are going through and are standing in solidarity with them. And that's why I thank every group I have the chance to speak to for being there, because their very presence on the campus is showing the students that somebody believes in them. Any other question? Another question down the back? 
Oui, c'est une question d'un observateur extérieur à votre communauté. Je suis intrigué par l'absence de lien qui est fait entre les différents et passionnants exposés ce matin, entre nouvelles technologies, enjeux de l'internationalisation, mobilité et, et solidarité. Est-ce que ce ne se dégage pas à l'évidence la nécessité que vous construisiez un tronc commun de connaissances autour duquel vous mutualiseriez vos compétences pour construire des cours en commun, des cours à distance, relayés localement Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas une évidence pour la FUC de s'engager solidairement Puisque le mot solidaire, vous avez raison de souligner, ce n'est pas de la charité. Solidaire, ça vient de in solidum, ça vient de la capacité à s'engager mutuellement, à s'engager pour, pour l'ensemble. Il, il me semble, à écouter de l'extérieur les conférences passionnantes de ce matin, que c'est la conclusion évidente qui devrait se dégager. Vous m'en excusez. Anybody want to respond to that? I think your proposal is good. Uh, in some areas, they may, not, they may not be able to use the internet, as my brother said. It's, they don't have the internet. So, but in some areas, you may have the internet. So it, may, it will apply to some communities. It may not apply uh, to other communities. But as you rightly say, uh, we should use, if you can help uh, galvanize support to use the modern you know, means of communication to, to, uh, to train the students. One of the things that I find in Africa is that a mobile phone, almost everyone, even the, the people in the villages, have a mobile phone. So I was so excited about the mobile project. You can use that to learn, and that's what we're trying to do now. How do we use what is common in our own environments to, to keep hope alive? And I think that's where we could look at each environment should be able to come out with what, what tool they will need to help young people learn and keep hope alive. Thank you. Okay, we need to bring this to an end, but I think the uh, President Roosevelt at one stage says, do what you can where you are with what you have. And I think uh, that's a challenge that each of us has. And I think uh, some of the things that have been mentioned here, this, not only in this session, but earlier, of ways of engaging with one another to find support so that the young people that are entrusted to us get the best possible education they can. So shukran, thank you for being here and thank you for this opportunity. Merci beaucoup euh, au frère euh, Dre aussi qui a euh, animé cette table ronde. I forgot to introduce uh, brother Dre uh, when he started. Alors euh, nous avons quelques minutes d'abord euh, pour euh, dévoiler le résultat des élections. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a des gens, c'est vous euh, Hugh qui allez euh, prendre ça Bon. Euh, avant qu'on dévoile euh, les résultats Simplement vous dire qu'on euh, a fait note d'une erreur sur le bulletin de vote. Donc, euh, le bulletin disait euh, euh, Francisco Sanchez Campos, Costa Rica University, alors que le prénom du candidat, c'est Fernando. Alors, euh, nous avons consulté un conseiller juridique à savoir si cette erreur euh, invalidait euh, les élections. Et le conseiller juridique qui est dans la salle présentement nous confirme qu'il s'agit sur le plan technique d'une erreur euh, matérielle euh, qui ne change rien euh, au résultat parce qu'on pouvait très bien identifier le candidat étant donné qu'on avait nommé le nom de l'université et le pays. Donc, je veux rassurer tout le monde sur la validité. Voilà. So thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Yes, suspense. 
we, we don't quite have a drum roll, so we're not going to go there. Uh, I should explain that a, uh, associate members have one vote and then regular full members have two votes. So the uh, total electorate, the total votes cast, and all votes were valid. The total votes cast were 85. Of those, 82 were full members, so those are doubled, and so when you hear the numbers, they're much higher. Uh, and there were three uh, associate votes, which means that those votes count for one. So on the first count, which we uh, used, we counted the ballot on the venue for the next meeting, and the three candidates were um, uh, from respective countries of Mexico, USA, and Chile. Uh, we had in, in third place with a total of 39 Mexico, uh, in second place with a total of 48 Chile, and in first place, uh, Boston College uh, with a total of 80. And when you do the addition on both this vote and the other vote, the total number comes to 167, which is made out of 82 by 2 and 3 by 1. So in other words, 164 uh, from the uh, regular members and 3 from the associate members. So the total, total weighting, the total number we use is 167. And so uh, going... Uh, to the vote for the uh, new incoming president. Uh, the candidates were from Portugal and from Costa Rica, respectively, and uh, in second place with a total of uh, 65 uh, was Fernando Sanchez Campos, and in first place uh, with a total of 102 was uh, Isabel Capello Agil. I guess you want to hear from the new president. So, uh, Isabel, if you could say a few words before we go to lunch. So, thank you. <laughs> I also have a, this is for the end. Let's see whether I can. Oh, it's here. It's here. Dear colleagues, dear Professor Pedro Rubens, dear Francois, council members, it is indeed a great honor to have been elected as president of the boards of the International Federation of Catholic Universities. I'm humbled to have received your support 
and pledge to work over the next three years to continue to modernize the structure, place accountability at the heart of the operation, work transparently to empower the Federation, and make it a convincing voice of Catholicity in higher education. This election, which for the first time had more than one candidate, is an expression of IFCO's transformation. Different and yet not opposed, perspectives on the role of IFCO were presented and you were able to make an informed choice. Let me first greet Dr. Fernando Sanchez Campos. Thank him for the dedication to IFCU and say that as president of IFCU, I look forward to working with the Catholic University of Costa Rica and develop the Common Good Observatory he so wonderfully presented to us a few days ago and count on his collaboration. But in fact, laying out the seeds of IFCU's renovation was the work of our outgoing president, Father Pedro Rubens. With his calm but determined manner, wisdom, and diplomacy, he has steered the Federation over the past six years and guided its transition. These are indeed very big shoes to fill. His task was defining for us today to be able to discuss renewal and professionalization. I will work to widen the doors you have opened. Let us all thank him warmly and give him a round of applause. Let me thank as well all the members of the administration board for their service, Thierry Magnin, Chantal Beauvais, Jacinta, all the members of the secretariat, the executive council as well. And what is to be done now? Let me start with a metaphor. Michelangelo left and finished a group of six statues built for the grave of Pope Julius II that art historians have given the name I Prigioni the slaves or the prisoners. They capture unfinished figures that thus seem to emerge from the marble blocks unsuccessfully. Michelangelo's slaves are perhaps an inspiring image to the work of Catholic universities. They represent a struggle, the suffering of creation seeking completion, but also the dream of being whole. They represent, in fact, the rich potential of the labor of universities, because a university is always a set of possibilities. We are Catholic universities, and this identity is not one of the pillars of the university, but it is, it's substantive, it's substanti substantial to the university itself. As with the Prigioni, we will never be done with asking the question of what this means for us what it means to be a Catholic university. We will never be complete or whole, but our mission is to keep asking and reflect that question in all our actions. Nowadays, universities are facing tremendous challenges. They are the focal point of a new economic model that is no longer simply based on manufacturing and commodities, but is driven and led by those who own intellectual capital. This clearly requires stronger links with stakeholders in the community, be they NGOs or businesses, foundations and cultural institutions, citizen initiatives and institutional strategies. It means that stakeholders in the community will increasingly tap into the resources available in universities more effectively and universities must be flexible in catering to these changing demands. Our edge is that as Catholic universities, we will act to meet these demands by means of a value-driven education. A church that goes forth requires universities that go forth, that are on the move. 
This means precisely articulating the local with the global, leveraging our local presence with a wider international network of universities, bound together by their identity as Catholic institutions and committed to jointly create impact in a world that increasingly needs institutions that create value for society, be it economic, scientific, social, and cultural, informed by values. To act in concrete terms as the Holy Father challenges means to take up challenges where they are diagnosed. To act in concrete terms, then, also means, in this case, to take up the challenge and the noble mission of working with IFCU representing IFCU, reinforcing its global voice, and providing spaces for its many internal voices to be heard. It means addressing the different development stages of its member universities in a spirit of sustainable solidarity and with focused initiatives so that, so that the power of the, a few may be the strength of the many. Across it all stand our commonly shared values, a Catholic identity that binds us to respect human dignity, a commitment to an education driven by values, but also the pursuit of excellent science, advancing the borders of knowledge. We need to be at the vanguard of development, because only thus may we labor towards research unwavering, unwaveringly committed to the common good and not to the profit of the few. On these occasions, a candidate now elected usually speaks of a track record. I have an internet path, so I will not talk about this. But I wish to say two things. One is that I also understand my election is transformative, not exclusively because I'm a woman, but also because I am one. I come from an institution that has a tradition of empowering women. I'm the second woman rector and have implemented a strong leadership agenda which makes us a university with circa 45% representation of women on boards. It is wonderful to see the many women rectors here today in this federation, and I look forward to having you all insp inspiring young women to take up the responsibility of working with the church in the great work of higher education. And secondly, I come with baggage. I have the great privilege of leading a remarkable university, Universidad Católica Portuguesa, with some prestigious alums amongst you today. I leave you with a short video that was made for the celebration of our 50th anniversary, and thank you again very warmly for your trust. I am committed to affirm my Catholic values in full dialogue with society, deeply passionate about the mission of universities to solidify, empower, the, and, and empower the youth, and driven to contribute to strengthen IFCU's role as an acknowledged voice of Catholic higher education. So I leave you with a video now of Lisbon and Porto. Let's see. Oops, no sound. We should have now some. I open my eyes. Yes. The future is already here. We are a dot, complex, interconnected Oops. network. The ocean. It has always felt very close to me. In school, when people asked me what I wanted to become, I'd answer that my dream was to be a scientist. I enjoyed the idea of exploring new worlds in this world. Life is transformed, walls collapse, new possibilities arise, novelty is all around us. The recipe for success? I think it's to be aware that as important as choosing the road ahead is selecting a trusted partner to be by your side and guide you.
Muito boa tarde a todos. O tema que preparei hoje uh, e a minha apresentação. O mestrado em Ciências da Comunicação da Universidade Católica continua a ser o programa líder em Portugal e o 25º na Europa. Já na variante de marketing, distinguiu-se com a 21ª posição a nível continental. The 50th anniversary of Catholica is an occasion to renovate our pact with the future. We are committed to cultivate science for the common good, understanding the university as an open, diverse and responsive community. What defines Catholica is the cultivation of the great ideas, crafting the experience of a lifetime, of cultivating knowledge, inherited across the ages, embracing change and preparing for the future. As we celebrate our anniversary, the university is treading new grounds, embarking on unique projects. We celebrate value with values. It is my deepest conviction that over the next 50 years, Catholica, its faculty, staff, students and alumni will continue to make a difference, advancing knowledge for the good of humanity. When we are kids, Everyone encourages us to dream big. It's all about experimentation and opportunities. But then, as we grow older, it is as if our freedom is curtailed. But as I look back on my life, I'm thankful to Catholica for actually allowing my dreams to come true. This university has given me many opportunities, opened many doors, and has broadened my horizons. Um, I am told that I should address the question of uh, voting for vice president, uh, but um, Francois. Ah oui, donc, euh, mais Nicolas m'a dit que euh, on pourrait faire ça après le lunch parce qu'il reste des choses à peaufiner. Donc, euh, après le lunch, euh, nous pourrons commencer à voter euh, pour euh, les vice-présidents.
Alors, euh, ben, là, c'est le temps de prendre le lunch. Avez-vous faim? Oui. Oh, allez-y. Et de retour euh, à 14 heures. À 14 heures, il faut être ici, hein? We're going to release this to the media.